Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Nadav Klein. He is an assistant professor of organizational behavior at INSEAD. His research focuses on the basic processes of judgment that affect how people make decisions, process information and evaluate others and themselves. Some of the findings he has explored are the surprising reputational benefits of being a little bit nice to other people, the ability of groups to detect lies, people's weak desire to be seen as moral and strong, desire not to be seen as, in, as immoral, and people's overestimation of how much information they use to make decisions. And those are going to be basically the topics of our discussion today. So, Dr. Klein, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Oh, same here. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So, uh, I would like to start the conversation by focusing on reputation, because I guess that for us as a social species, uh, reputation, particularly social reputation, is a very important aspect in our lives. And my first question would simply be, what is reputation or what are the elements that are important for people's social reputation? Great question. So you, it wouldn't surprise you when I say that the reputation is a, the collective belief that people have on who we are and what drives us and what makes us act the way we do. And obviously it's important. I mean, it's important because uh, people care about it. We know that, that people care about how they're seen by others. Um, but it's important also because it changes uh, whether people approach and avoid us in different situations. So if somebody has a negative reputation, you'll be less likely to approach them and engage in a social interaction with them in the first place. And if somebody has a good reputation, then vice versa, you'd be more likely to approach them and engage in a social interaction with them. What's interesting, there's several interesting things here. I think one is the reputation matters before the interaction starts. So before we start a conversation, it matters what I think of you and what you think of me. But once we start talking, it matters a lot less because we tend to react in the moment and we tend to uh, respond to what the person is saying in a way that sort of changes uh, what we think about that person. So there's a very big difference between the reputation a person has before we interact with them and then when we actually interact with them. It turns out reputation matters in our decision to interact in the first place rather than during the interaction. Um, there an there's another uh, interesting point in reputation is that People care about how, how they're seen by others, but they don't have like an accurate, often they don't have accurate information about that, okay? So I might have some idea of what you think of me, but I don't know for sure. And so what we're dealing with is really my assumption of what you think of me. And that's an imperfect assumption because I don't have direct access to what you think of me. I can only assume and I can assume the best or I can assume the worst, but it requires me to sort of try to take your perspective and understand what you think of me, and that's not an easy process. In fact, it's very hard to be accurate in perspective taking. And the final thing I'll say before I'll be quiet is that uh, there's kind of a competition in people's behavior in terms of how they're seen by others and how they're seen by themselves. And often these th do things go together. So if I do something in order to be seen well by you, in order for you to think good of me, Oftentimes, that's going to be the thing that's going to make me feel good about myself. Like, for example, pro-social behavior or being generous or being altruistic. I would appreciate that about myself, and I think you'd appreciate that about me. But sometimes these things diverge, and so people sometimes have tension between doing things that would make themselves look good in their own eyes versus things that would like make them look good in others' eyes. And there's, there's this kind of reputation, social reputation and self-reputation that uh, sometimes would diverge. So, long answer. <laughs> no, no, not at all, not at all. So it's very interesting. So let me just ask you one thing. So is it the case that when we approach a new person, for example, of course, we have that tendency to have a first impression of that person as soon as we see them because of some physical trait or some uh, behavioral trait, for example, that is very easy to pick up on. And we immediately start forming a mental image of what that person is like. And sometimes we also come 
with uh, previous information that other people gave us about that particular person that we're going to meet ourselves and we already have sort of a reputation attached to them. But as we go and interact over time with that person, there can be some readjust, uh, readjustment then of that uh, reputation or that idea that we have of that specific person. Yeah, definitely. And that's uh, sometimes it's called individuation. So mm -hmm. before you meet the person, they're just a blank slate and maybe you know something about them from rumors or from reading something in a newspaper. But once you meet them, they become an individual. Once you talk to them or whatever, and let's assume that you are talking to them, you can choose not to talk to them, as we mentioned before. You can choose to avoid them, which is a very significant and consequential decision because then you never get a chance to see if your idea of, the, of their reputation is correct or not. But if you are talking to them, um, it turns out that whatever previous impression you had that's not based on interaction is actually quite weak. Um, so, so imagine that you think that somebody, somebody told you that another person is uh, cruel and mean and nasty or whatever, and then, but you happen to meet them and they're perfectly nice to you. Um, you can see how your idea of that person changes completely. I mean, not entirely, but, uh, but significantly because the, mo the interactions that we have with others have a significant effect on what we think of them, more so than information that we get before we interact with them. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And it's also because uh, it's normal for us to establish different kinds of relationships with different people. And so even the fact that perhaps one person is mean to another person and that third person comes to me and tells me, oh, that guy is a mean person then. And I go and interact with him. And after all, he's very sympathetic, sympathetic to me. I mean, that could just happen that he doesn't like the other person and likes me or something like that. So, I mean, even when, even in terms of reputation, maybe there's not one single social reputation that people have, but it depends uh, on the person they are interacting with and how they establish their relationships. Yeah, I mean, and that uh, uh, touches into a very important insight uh, that social psychology has I think communicated to the rest of the scientific community and the rest of the world, and I'm a social psychologist for better or worse, um, which is that uh, people tend, so there are two main factors that affect our behavior. One is who we are, our, our character, our traits, whatever, but the other thing is the situation that we're in. Okay, so a lot of social situations make us act in the same way, even though we might have different personality traits. So for example, if you see a person uh, being hit by a car, most people would run to help that person. Um, because there's a need for somebody to be helped and you don't think about it, you just do it. Um, but those, those people that run to help, some of them might be generous, some of them might be selfish, you don't know. But this, the power of the situation is very strong. Well, it turns out that people tend to uh, um, underweight the power of the situation when they think about people. So in your example, imagine you hear that somebody is mean and nasty to another person and then you go and talk to them. Well, it might be that that person was mean and nasty because that situation demanded it, that maybe the first person cheated them or lied to them or stole from them or whatever. And so anybody would be mean and nasty to somebody who steals from you. But the person you talk to would say, oh, that person is always mean, is always nasty and don't even talk to them. But it might be that in different situations, we act in different ways. And, but we tend to overgeneralize and say, oh, if we saw one behavior in one situation, that means it would apply to any situation. And so we tag that person as mean and nasty or whatever. So, so anyway, that's mm -hmm. yeah, one sure. Of and are there a set of things or traits, for example, that people pay attention to in other people, in order, or that they use, let's say, to build up their social reputation? I mean, what are the kinds of things that people pay attention to in other people? Yeah, so a lot of research, not done by me, but by other smart social psychologists, uh, shows that. So we care about a lot of traits, obviously we care if the person is nice and generous and competent and skillful or whatever. It turns out if you take all of these traits that we care about other people, they turn off, they sort of fall into two big groups. Um, and psychologists have termed those warmth and competence. So competence is easy to, easy to understand, is the ability of a person to achieve their goals. So if you're competent and skillful and smart and intelligent, you're more likely to achieve the goals that you set for yourself than if you're not. 
Um, and warmth, re warmth relates to how we treat other people. So how, are you warm? Are you nice? Are you generous? Are you honest? Um, and so we have this, these two constellations that people care about. One is, can they achieve their own goals, competence? And the other is, are they nice and they treat other people well, warmth? It turns out that warmth matters more. Like if you had to do a competition, both matter, but warmth matters more in more situations than competence does. Um, and warmth can be further subdivided into sort of morality, like are you an ethical, moral person versus are you a sociable person? Are you like the life of the party? Do you have good conversations? Are you interesting? And so on like that. So warmth and competence are the main things that people care about when they evaluate others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you know if these are universal traits, that is, things that people across societies, across the globe, really care about and pay attention to, or if these studies have been done mostly on what's been termed weird societies, that is, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic societies? I'm asking you because there's that sort of problem, right, in some of the literature in psychology, particularly social psychology. So is it something, uh, is it a human universal or, or not? Yeah, I mean, um, I think the answer to that is largely yes, in the sense that uh, people across cultures, not just weird cultures, uh, care about these traits. However, um, how we define what it means to be nice can differ a lot between cultures. So the culture gives you a sense of meaning. What does it mean to be nice or not? So for example, um, uh, let me ask you. So if you see somebody leave their wallet uh, in a restaurant, they were eating in a restaurant and they happen, you notice they happen to leave their wallet and left. So question, if you take the wallet for yourself and keep the money, is that unethical or not? So what would you say to that? That's unethical. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking publicly on YouTube, so it's very important. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But you see a huge variability in terms of whether people think left wallets um, in random places and saw if people returned them. They left some information that you can call and say, oh, I found the wallet and uh, I would like to return it. You see different countries, you see very different rates of returning the wallet. And they also manipulated whether there was money or not in the wallet. That tended to make people more likely to return the wallet if there was money in it because it's more consequential. Um, but it does suggest that so, so for me, it's also unethical to take a wallet, even though the person left it in a restaurant. But for another person, for their culture, that might not be because you can think, well, they left it. I mean, they don't know that it's gone and they should have been more careful or whatever. So um, and that's true for a lot of things, like even the definition of competence can be uh, culturally defined. So even though people care about these traits across cultures, the definition of what each trait means could differ between cultures. So, <laughs> yeah. And what about pro-sociality? Because I guess that pro-sociality is a very important feature of our species. We are very pro-social and I would guess that people would put a lot of value on someone being pro-social, for, even for the benefit of the, the group itself. So. Uh, I mean, to what extent do people value pro-sociality? And also, maybe, uh, I, I mean, it, it's good, but it's also something costly to the individual, right? Yeah, I mean, so the large answer is yes. Uh, people do value pro-sociality in others, and they also value when they themselves are pro-social. So there's research showing that... Um, when you give to others, when you do something for others, it makes you happier and makes you feel like your life is more meaningful. But um, there are several interesting wrinkles to this. One is that people are not sense, they like it when others are pro-social and they are generous and they take up their time and effort to help, but they're not sensitive to the magnitude of it. Okay, so I can give you $5 or I can give you $5,000. And my prediction based on research is that, that you devaluate me just the same even though the amounts are very, very different, right? So I can, it's, it can be a little bit costly for me to be pro-social. I can be a little bit nice, or I can be really, really nice, and it can be very costly for me. But people's evaluations are just the same in terms of that. They're not sensitive to magnitude, So, um, which is interesting. So if one practical recommendation from that you can imagine is that if you want to build a good reputation, just be a little bit nice. You don't have to be Mother Teresa. 
just be a little bit nice to a lot of people, and then you'll build a positive reputation really, really quickly. And I wonder, I mean, there's no evidence for it. It's just a speculation. But I wonder if that's a good way to work evolutionarily, right? Because it's very, as you said, it's very costly to be pro-social. And if in order to attain a good reputation, you have to be extremely generous all the time, then that's very costly. That's not sustainable. But if you have to be a little bit generous, then it's a little bit costly to you. So it matters to you, given that it's costly, you would think highly of the fact that you gave something. It, it's meaningful to you. But it also doesn't require you too much cost so that you'll never do it. So it's an interesting phenomena about pro-sociality is that people are very, they care about it a lot, but they're insensitive to its magnitude. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I would like to ask you about how people think about their own and others' moral behavior and how good and bad they think they themselves are and other people and if other people can, can improve their behavior and to what extent. So my first question about all of that would be, uh, could you tell us about the concept of bounded self-righteousness, what it is yeah. about? Yeah, so self-righteousness is the tendency to think that we are very ethical and moral people. So if you go around the street, so you can go to uh, uh, prisons of uh, violent criminals and ask them if they think that they are more ethical than other people, and they'll say, yes, I'm, I'm more ethical than the average person, even though you think, okay, well, statistically, that, can make, that doesn't make much sense because you're in prison for a violent crime. Um, and I'm citing previous research here. Um, however, what is interesting there is that this sense of self-righteousness, feeling that I'm righteous or, or, or you know, moral, is asymmetric. Um, so it's not so much that people think that they are more ethical or moral than others. It's just to think that they think that they're less evil than others. So you might be capable of very bad things like stealing a wallet or lying to people or stealing or whatever. I'm not. You know, and so people see a clear difference between themselves and others in terms of the propensity to do unethical things, but they don't necessarily they don't necessarily think that they're more capable of moral things than others. So if you ask me how likely am I to donate blood or um, to do a favor, a big favor to my best friend versus the average person, I would say oh, I'm about as likely as the average person. You know, I'm no more likely than them, and that's the sense in which self righteousness is bounded. It happens a lot in the evil side, right? People distance themselves from evil. So it matters to the self-concept that they don't think of themselves as evil. Mm -hmm. So all the processes of motivated reasoning and reconceptualizing bad things that you did uh, are brought to bear on stuff that would be considered unethical. So when people do unethical things, they tend to reframe them as, oh, well, there was a reason for it, or I had to do it, or whatever it is. But for positive things, or failure to do positive things, people are far less likely to care about those, uh, partly because it's, it looks like they, they don't see themselves as holier than thou, they just see themselves as less evil than others, which is an interesting find. Well, um, I was just asking you, uh, people typecast other people as good or bad people, good or bad agents or whatever. When they do that, uh, to what extent do people think that people are able to change their moral character or that it is simply stable throughout their lives? Yeah, so, and as I was mentioning, uh, a couple of things. One is this distinction between person and situation. So if you explain another person's behavior based on their personal trait, their disposition, their character, then of course it's very hard to change because that's who they are and that's stable, but if you explain their behavior based on the situation that they're in, then it's easier to change because you can imagine the situation changing and then their behavior is changing. So for example, uh, a few years ago in 2013, I was hit by a car when I was crossing the street. I was fine. I was not injured, but everybody, this was in Chicago, everybody around and just rushed to my rescue and stopped the driver and called an ambulance and everything. And Question, does that mean that that neighborhood or people in that neighborhood are altruistic and self-sacrificing and nice? Or is it the fact that they see somebody lying in the street getting hit by a car makes them behave the way they do? And depending on your answer to that, you will come out with a different opinion about whether uh, this is who they are or is it the situation that made them act this way? So research suggests that 
for positive behaviors, kind of broadly speaking, people tend to explain it in terms of personal uh, characteristics. So if you are generous, that's who you are. It's more likely that people would say that as opposed to the situation. Uh, whereas for negative behaviors, uh, it really matters if, if you did it or if another person did it. If you did it, you would explain it by the situation. Um, and, and if other people did it, they also would explain it by, situ by the situation by to a lesser degree. Mm -hmm. So that the, this distinction between person and situation matters. Um, it also matters whether the behavior is pertaining to what we talked about before with the warmth and competence thing. So if it's a behavior that's related to your own goals, so did you uh, get a promotion or did you do well on a test or did you, uh, do you manage your finances well, um, people are more likely to think that you can improve or at least can change over time. So um, they can see how a person who works really hard or studies really hard or stays with a skill would improve in it. But with warmth traits like generosity, altruism, it's harder to, ch people have a hard time believing that a person can change. And that's not something motivational or any kind of uh, sophisticated thing. It's just something we talked about before is that people see, are, are insensitive to magnitude in warmth traits. So if you're a little bit nice or really, really nice, people see that as the same thing. It's harder for them to see, you know, donating $10 or donating $100 as qualitatively different. They interpret those behaviors as the same. And so for them to think about, oh, you can improve from one stage to another in the warmth domain, in the generosity altruism domain, it's harder for them to think about that because they see those levels of warmth as kind of very, very similar. Um, so this is interesting. It would suggest that reputation related to warmth is more sticky just because people don't see, it's harder for them to see uh, changes in that reputation versus reputation related to competence. That's one possibility, uh, one practical implication of that. Mm -hmm. And when there's some sort of positive change, for example, a bad person turns into a good person or someone acquires some sort of uh, competency, for example, uh, I mean, uh, this has to do a little bit with how people love their stories and things like that in movies, for example. Do they find it more inspirational if it's effortful than if the person is simply innately good or innately competent and didn't have to put uh, as much effort into becoming what they became? Or I mean, how do people think about those sorts of things? Yeah, so you can think about the person who gets straight A's because they're very, very smart or the person who gets straight A's because they work really, really hard. Which is more um, uh, inspirational or interesting or attractive to people? Yeah. Um, so this is, so other people have done this research. So do you like the people who are natural or the people who are work for it? And it turns out that there's an interesting asymmetry. So you like and are inspired more by the person who works hard for it uh, than the person who's a natural who doesn't make any effort. But if you had to choose somebody to be on your team, you'll choose the natural. Uh, for whatever reason, you think that they're natural, they don't have to work for it, so I'd like to, if anything is related to my own outcomes, I'd like to have the natural with me. So it's an interesting asymmetry. There's also a third student here that we've studied. Uh, so there's the person who gets straight A's because they get out of bed, they do nothing at all, they're just talented. There's the person who gets straight A's because they work really, really hard. And then there's the person who used to get C's but now they get A. So they used to be really bad at whatever they're working on, but now they're much improved. Um, and it turns out people are inspired by that person, the improved person, the most. Um, and that's partly because of what you mentioned, the idea of effort and struggle is very inspirational. There's a lot of stories of redemption in movies, and we're just very attracted to that. Part of it is cultural, but it's also across cultures, that if you can change your situation from bad to good, that's really, really great, and that's... Um, uh, very inspirational. Um, however, if you think about it, um, there's a sense where this emphasis on positive change is a little bit misplaced or, or, or kind of it, it misses the fact that the person who got straight A's because they had to work really hard for it, that's really, really hard and that's really, really impressive, you know. Um, however, people do prefer the person who used to get C's but now they get A's because they can, there's evidence, quote unquote, of the effort that they put in, right? Effort is something internal and psychological, you can't, you don't have direct access to it. So if I can see that you got C's and now you get A's, I'm like, oh, you must have put in a lot of effort. You do, obviously don't have the talent initially, so you must have worked really hard. 
if you get only straight A's, I might wrong, wrongly assume that it was easy for you. And if it was easy for you, then it's not inspiring. And sometimes that's right. Sometimes the person didn't have to make a lot of effort to get straight A's, but sometimes it's wrong because the person who gets straight A's really usually work really, really hard. In fact, if you ask people about their own achievements, they think that their own stability or doing something well for a long period of time, persevering, that's more inspiring than you know being bad and then turning into good. But for others, because we don't have evidence of other people's struggle and effort and willpower, that's why we value change as something inspiration, more inspirational than stability. Like if you look, at, so I work in a business school. If you look in business schools, nobody, there's no programs that advertise as this will make you be a more stable manager. This will make you, you know, persevere in your company and keep it maintain uh, its good state. Instead, you see, let's change. This program would teach you how to manage change. This program might teach you how to improve. That's because in others we value change, positive change, but in ourselves we value stability. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there are all those layers and uh, I, I mean, perhaps people like those sorts of uh, stories of effort that people have to overcome big obstacles because it's really, uh, let's say, uh, an in-your-face evidence that that person really had to put in the effort uh, but on the other end, as you said, the straight A student from the beginning maybe was working as hard or even harder than the other guy. But uh, I mean, people don't recognize him as much. So. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's, and then, and so one question you might ask is, how did the straight A student communicate that they worked really, really hard? Um, and that's a tough question because you can't just, I can't come to you and say, hey, listen, Ricardo, I worked really, really hard for my uh, grades and it was really tough. And because that would be seen a little self presentation or a little self promote kind of thing. And so they need to find a way to um, present themselves in a way that, that it's not off putting, but still emphasizes they work really, really hard. And I think one answer might be to, um, uh, you know, communicate your uh, shortcomings or somehow your disadvantages or the fact that you struggled in a, in a credible way, right? So if you're always straight A's, don't talk about that, but talk about another area of your life that you struggle and you had to overcome it uh, in order to, sh to sort of quote unquote, show people evidence of your effort and your struggle. And sort of like you lead by, instead of leading with the right foot, you lead with your left foot, which, which is you, re you lead with your disadvantages, so long as you actually improved on them. So if you never improved, then it's not a good idea to lead with your left foot. But if you have improved, that might be more persuasive or more uh, effective self-presentational strategy, you might think. Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, I mean, another aspect that we in human societies have to deal with is detecting liars or <laughs> because, I mean, we can be exploited by them. So what are the kinds of strategies that groups resort to in order to detect these people, these liars? Yeah. So let me ask you, do you think that people are good lie detectors, bad? What do you think on average the percentage of lies that are detected if you did lab experiments where the person is either telling the truth or lying? What's the percentage? The percentage, uh, I would say 30 percent. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so, so what is the percentage? <laughs> so you're more pessimistic than the reality. Like, so if you think about it, by chance, if somebody is telling the truth or lying, 50 percent of the time you should get it right because it's chance. People are slightly better than 54 percent of the time, according to meta-analysis okay. of many, many studies. So it's better than a coin flip, but it's not great, right? I mean. Uh, part of the reason for that is because it's very hard to detect lies. We all think that there's some tell that like if the person is winking or if they're talking fast or if they're talking a lot or maybe if they're talking a little, you know, if they if they respond with one word, maybe they, all these things are basically a barren wasteland. I mean, there isn't a signal, a reliable signal uh, for detecting lies. And so it's really it's a hard task, kind of an in-person detecting lies kind of thing. Uh, it's all, it also occurs partly because we have something called the truth bias, is where we tend to believe other people when they tell us something, more so than we tend to disbelieve them. Um, and so th there have been a lot of experiments uh, trying to see in what conditions, what conditions help, help people detect lies better. Um, in some of our work, we try to see if groups, as opposed to individuals, can detect lies better. 
And so if you think about it, groups can detect lies in two ways. One, they can do so by talking to each other, right? So do you think this person is lying? What do you think? And so on. And the other uh, way is by not talking to each other, okay? So if you look at existing research, it would actually favor the not talking to each other route. I mean, there's something called wisdom of crowds. Have you heard about this uh, term, wisdom of crowds? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the idea that um, if you take independent guesses by people who haven't spoken to each other, just made a guess about something, and you average them out, then the errors would cancel each other out, and so the average of the group would be way better than each individual guess. Um, however, we don't find that in lie detection. So it doesn't work to ask 100 people to try to detect whether somebody's telling the truth or lying and then averaging out these guesses. That doesn't work. Partly because people are truth biased, right? Everybody is biased in a certain way. Everybody is more likely to say that that person is telling the truth as opposed to lying. And so the average will also be biased. If there's a systematic bias ahead of time, then the average would also be systematically biased. Instead, people uh, as groups are better at detecting lies by talking to each other. Um, and the answer why is a little cloudy at this point. Like we've, we've found it in our work and other people have found it in their work. One reason might be, we think, is because when you are in a group, um, when you say that person is lying, you can't just say it, you have to say why. And so I think that person is lying because he's winking, whatever. And then you tell me, oh, well, I don't know, I think winking has nothing to do with it. Or you might say, yes, winking is totally right and whatever. And that discussion, we all have half-baked intuition about why a person is lying. We all have these half-formulated thoughts, whatever. That discussion tends to expose the, those thoughts and make them a little bit better so that if something is completely unreasonable or illogical, it doesn't pass mustard in a group setting where it might pass mustard in a pass muster in an individual setting. So we find that groups tend to, I mean, on average, they detect lies better than individuals. And we think it's because of that reason that they, there's all these half-baked thoughts that when aired out in a discussion tend to help groups where in individual level they wouldn't air out at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th th this is all very interesting because, uh, I mean, uh, people talk a lot about lie detection, but there isn't really some sort of textbook writer out there with a set of traits that you can learn. I mean, for example, you look at the person and she has some sort of facial expression or she's doing something with her eyes or she's moving her hands in a certain way or the vocal intona intonation is a certain way or something like that. I mean, we don't really have a list of uh, like that of things that allow for us to detect lies accurately. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there are people in professions whose job it is to detect lies, right? So um, FBI agents or Secret Service or something. But it's actually quite hard. They did, um, in the in the mid-2010s, they did a program in the United States where they implemented a method to try to detect lies called micro-expressions. So it's not an expression, it's a micro-expression. So it's a tiny expression. So you train people to try to detect these micro-expressions because presumably those predict um, you know, whether the person is lying or not. Um, and uh, then they evaluated that program and it turns out a very small percentage, I'm talking less than 5% of uh, the people who were referred, so this, these, are, these were done in airports, so these are um, TSA, which I don't know what it stands for, but this is the people who are in charge of airport security in the United States and they were trained in micro expressions. Um, a very small percentage of people who were referred from, um, based on the, this micro-expression technique, were actually found to be lying or carrying something suspicious or whatever. So it's a very small chances of success. Partly it's because lie detection is really hard and lies are very uncommon, right? I mean, most of the time we tell the truth. So it's like finding a needle in a haystack. So it's, very, it's a very difficult thing to do in real, in real life. For the most part, we are telling the truth. So it's very, very difficult to do in general. But no, I don't think that the research suggests that there's any surefire way of detecting lies. Um, and so we are resorting to things like using a group or, well, I mean, research is working on it. So hopefully we'll find answers over time and we are finding them slowly but surely. You know, that's what it is. So, yeah. so maybe it's because most of the time we are not telling lies, we tell the truth. 
that yeah. during our evolutionary history maybe we weren't exposed to enough or strong enough selective pressures for us to evolve a lie detection system that is strong enough to detect lies with higher ac accuracy or something like that. Maybe, yeah. I mean, another way to, to think about it is it might be that, look, if I lie to you today and you don't detect it, then yes, I gain something. But if I keep yeah. lying to people in general, then it becomes a little easier to detect me, right? Because there's several people I'm lying to and I have to keep the story straight and I have to, there's the old saying, you can lie to most people most of the time, but not to all people all the time. And so it might be that lie detection happened as a group effort, right? So yes, every, every individual instance I can lie to you and not be detected, but over time I will be detected because we're social animals, we talk to each other and we realize there's inconsistencies. And so it might be that that's the way that we were able to, you know, cooperate with each other without being overrun by people who are lying to us all the time. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, I understand. Okay, so let me just ask you one last question. We've already referred to pro-social behavior and how important it is in our human societies and the kinds of effects that we get from it. Um, because uh, it has directly to do with how people establish meaningful relationships with one another, does it also have any sort of connection with uh, meaning of life, that is how people attribute meaning to their own lives by their uh, pro-social behavior and how they establish relationships with other people on that basis? Yeah, so... Um uh, subjective is called subjective well-being, right? And that's uh, kind of the holy grail of the current generation, at least in the Western world, because we've conquered scarcity. There's no, we're not, we have too much stuff. We have too much food. We have too much cars. There's too much everything. And so now the pursuit is to be to have a happy life and a meaningful life. So subjective well-being usually is divided into two components. One is happiness, and the other one is meaningfulness of life. Life is meaningful. <laughs> And they're related. I mean, the correlation is 0.5, around 0.5. So most people who are happy are also people who find their life meaningful, but not always. It's not 100. It's not correlation of one. It's correlation of 0.5. Um, and there are differences between them. So one big difference is that happiness is about positivity. So if you have a positive time, uh, if you are um, enjoying yourself, if you're not in need of anything, then you're happy. But meaningful things are, us are sometimes negative things, like having kids, for example. I just had a child, which is great. Um, the studies show that it doesn't make you happy to have a child. Well, you have to, you know, you have to diaper and you have to feed them, you have to deal with them. But it makes your life meaningful. And meaning is defined as, as feeling like you're connected to something greater than yourself. Or to feel like your life has coherence, like all the things I did as a child or as a, a young adult are related to what I'm doing now in some interesting way and the time I met my best friend is related later on, 10 years later, and look, look, he's the best man in my wedding and so on. So a sense of coherence and a sense of my life is something greater than myself is what meaning is. And that's different from happiness in, in some respects. So it turns out that pro-social behavior increases both the sense of which you're happy in the moment, but it also increases the sense that your life is meaningful, partly because you think your self-worth is higher. You think you're more worthy um, because you're helping other people. And it increases, increases the sense of um, you are part of something greater than yourself. Um, and so uh, pro-social behavior has this uh, quality of um, giving you both meaning and both happiness uh, in your life. <laughs> okay, great. So, Dr. Klein, let's end the interview here. Before we go, uh, would you like to tell people what are the best places on the internet for them to find your work if they are interested? Yeah, so uh, some of, and I should say it's not just my work, a lot of this work was done with other researchers who are amazing and are superstars, and I'm so uh, fortunate to be working with them. So if you want to find out about the work, you can go to, uh, you can Google my name, uh, I'm at INSEAD now, so you can, you can do I-N-S-E-A-D, Google my name there. My papers should be on there. Also, the papers are um, written about in stuff like the Wall Street Journal or the Atlantic or Scientific American. 
you can uh, Google them as well. And Google Scholar will have my scientific papers if you want to read those. Those are slightly longer. Uh, so if you have extra time, you're welcome to do those, uh, to read those as well. Uh, these are interesting issues and important issues, and um, social psychologists have a certain perspective about them, and I hope uh, we're able to enlighten the other sciences as well as people in general uh, about these issues. Yeah, for sure. So I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview of both the podcast and the video interview so that people can go and check it out. It's very interesting. And so, Dr. Klein, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. And it was a real pleasure to have you and then to talk to you. Uh, pleasure was all mine. Thanks so much. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with leading intellectuals from around the world. And so, to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. You can also support me via PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Pereira Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Sergio Condriano, Jane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henrik Alenius, John Connors, Drs. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingart, my four producers, Isar Webbe, Rosie, Jim Frank, and Lucas Stafiniak, and my executive producer, Michel Rogieski. Thank you for all.